Am I still unmuted? All right. So good evening. Uh, welcome to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Today is November 18th, 2020. It's uh, 603. Uh, this is the Zoning Board of Appeals for the City of East Hampton. Uh, we have a few administrative items. First, uh, the approval of the minutes from our September 2nd, 2020 meeting. Making a motion. I move that we approve the minutes. Okay, Linda. Can I get a second? We have a couple of people. A couple of our members are on mute. Looks like Tony, Lindsay, and Jared are all on mute. If you could either unmute yourself or you can't, you're getting the big head shakes. <laughs> so Jamie, if you could take care of that. Oh, look at that. We have voices now. Okay. All right. So uh, can I get a second on the uh, motion for approving the minutes for the, for the September 2nd, 2020 meeting? I'll second it. All right, second is by Tony. All in favor by show of hands. All right. Okay. And correspondence requests or other comments from other John, boards? Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Um, per the, the change to the public meeting law for Zoom meetings, all uh, votes are supposed to be roll call. So oh. oh, we can't just I do can, it now. No, unfortunately, because sometimes people freeze um, <laughs> and we don't act actually know whether what they're what. You know, so we, we do need to do the the roll call. Okay, um, so I I will go with what my how my screen looks because we know everybody's screen looks a little different. All right, so a roll call vote for approval of the minutes of the September second, twenty twenty meeting. Anthony, I approve. Steve, I approve. Linda, I approve. Lindsay, I approve. Jared, yes, I approve. Okay, and I approve as well. Thank you. Okay. So correspondence or requests for comments from other boards, committees, or officials? Curtis is shaking his head no, so I am saying no. Okay, is, uh, I will now open it for a public speak time. If there's anyone who is on the call who's interested in speaking to anything that is not currently on the agenda for this evening's meeting, i.e. something not relevant to the application at 135 Main Street or the application for uh, 105 Pleasant Street. Does anyone have any questions or concerns or anything they'd like to speak about? Okay, so at this point, we will open up the public hearing. We're gonna start with uh, the first application, which is Rachel Smith. She's seeking a special building, uh, special permit under section 12.7 and 10.4 of the East Hampton Zoning Ordinance to operate a major home occupation as a hairstylist in her house. The property is located at 135 Main Street, map 144, parcel 59, in the residential urban R5 zoning district. So, <clears throat> do we have someone here? Ms. Phillips, are you here to speak or someone representing you? I do see Rachel in the call. Um, let me just. I, I did. I changed Hi. the setting. Oh, oh, hey, we hear you. We hear you. Yeah. We hear you. Okay. I changed the setting so people should be, allowed, should be able to mute and unmute themselves. Um, and Rachel, if you um, don't mind putting on your video so we can communicate with the board. Um, um, I can't put the video on, but I'm happy to speak if you need okay. me to answer any questions. Great. Okay. All right, so you are looking to uh, open up a home, home, a major home occupation at your home. If you could please explain your application. Um, well, I'm under the impression that any occupation done in the home that has any kind of client visitation is considered a major home occupation. Um, I'm a hairstylist and I plan to see a few private clients in my home. I won't have a sign out. You cannot uh, get an appointment with me unless you know me. There will be no walk-in traffic. There will be uh, one client at a time when I see them. 
It's a, it's a very, no one will know there's hair happening here. It will happen in a small room in my large house on Main Street and uh, any visitors here can park in my driveway. Okay. Well, let me just keep going here. I need to go here. All right. <clears throat> All right, so the findings based on that, um, you know, your application states that your business will occupy 238 square feet of your 2,592 square foot gross living space or about 9%, uh, two to six clients per week and they'll all park in your driveway. Yeah. So that looks pretty, uh, pretty standard. I have one comment, John. Yes, Linda. The house has only two parking spaces. It's a single width driveway, and there are two parking spaces. And it's a two family house, although the applicant is using it as a one family house. As a two family house, it requires four parking spaces. Um, so I would recommend that we make a condition that it stay a single family as long as the whole, I mean, use as a single family, as long as the home occupation is there, because a single family and a home occupation require three parking spaces and they only have two, but it legally is a two family, which needs four. So it works on paper. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And does anybody, any other board members have any questions? Well, that was the same concern I had as well was the parking because again, winter, you know, approaching and if both spaces are occupied, does that mean then the client will be parking in the street and would that be an obstruction? Well, legally they could have four cars there today, which means people would park in the street. And as a home occupation, technically it's only one more, not two. So it's an improvement. We only have one car um, anyway, and we're not planning to rent any part of our house out. So if okay. that's a concern, I, I'm not sure it is a concern. Uh, it, it's more of a regulatory concern. Just the fact that it is technically, it's, it's, it, it's taxed as a two family home. So by the eyes of the city, it's a two family home. And as a result, we have to follow those rules and regulations as uh, a city organization. Okay. Uh, as far as I, I, I just heard, we're not living beyond the parameters of the rules, even right. with the home well, occupation. I think it's fine no. with the condition. Yeah, no, it, it's it's fine. This is, this is merely a, a regulatory concern in order to in order to get you in order to get you approved you have to keep it a single family home um and what does that do to our tax rate that i have that's not my department i uh okay so i i wish i could help you but that's a that's the the so we're a two-family home and we're technically allowed to have four spaces. I'm not sure how putting a condition on that is required since we actually are allowed to have four cars. But by getting approval for the home occupation, you're required to have five spaces. You're grandfathered so, okay. in. I'm as... aware. I understand that. I'm just curious how I think before that would i would i would need to understand how that affects i didn't even look into the tax code and how that is affected um yeah so i would i would want to understand what that means with the permission of the board um would she need to hypothetically if miss phillips was to come forward to make the home into a multifamily occupancy or a, a two-family home would she not at that point need to get a permit that would take into account that she's currently got the home occupation there? That's a no, Jamie? 
Correct. Um, if, if it's currently zoned to family and being assessed as two family, then it's a two family <clears throat> house. And um, I don't know how, in, interior if it's um, divided as a two family anymore or how that works, but um, you know, when the permissions were, were granted or if it was grandfathered, but it would be, um, as it is now, it's it's sort of all pre-existing. And because of this, seeking this change for the home occupation would require there to be five off street parking spaces. Um, I think, you know, she could also come up, submit a new plan showing um, modification to the parking the driveway to create a wider driveway to have, um, a, you know, an, an extra spot, which would also uh, meet the, the needs of the, the board to have those off-street parking spaces. Um, I'm, I would be concerned that conditioning the um, conditioning the decision that it remains single family um, isn't that that there might be a more formal uh, to convert a two family house to a single family, I believe has other zoning. Um, I was only talking about it while the home occupation is there. You know, I don't know if she's planning on running the home occupation for years and using the house as a single family for years or what her plans are. I just Look, went out and looked and realized the parking was a problem because she's required to provide another parking space for the home occupation and it just can't. I don't think it could widen the driveway there, Jane. One, one possibility then, especially given that the current circumstances Ms. Phillips represented is that there's a single car and that it's really low traffic to site and would be very infrequent that you'd have a visitor staying for a very long period of time. Um, would be that you know if there are nuisance complaints about parking issues on the street um the 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 permit could be issued conditional upon not receiving a certain number of complaints within a certain time frame and that would not provide that would not make the board have to create a requirement right here and now but that we could eventually res the board could respond if there was a future issue but i don't think you would re you would um, receive complaints. I mean, I've parked probably in front of that house on a couple of occasions pre-COVID. If you went out to eat in that section of downtown East Hampton, like to Coco or Galaxy, you'd end up parking in front of her house just because there is no parking downtown. And if you get there at eight o'clock, everything's taken. So, and it's not something you would complain about. It's just an active downtown at certain times. And so people park on the street. I think for the, for the extent of this application, the home is currently occupied as a single family home. And, and I understand that it is zoned and taxed as a two family home. Uh, but for the purpose of this application, and if we're using the entire home as the, the gross footage of the home and thereby the calculation, we have to then consider that it is a single family home and that we should deem it and respect it as such. And thereby, if there's parking for the homeowner and the additional increase in traffic of one person at a time, then there should be enough time, there's enough room in the parking area for this to meet the requirement. I would recommend that we, we, I would recommend we approve this with a condition and then do all the paperwork, send it to the applicant. And before she files it on the land records and makes it permanent, she can talk to city hall about the tax implications, et cetera. And if she decides that she doesn't like the answer she gets, she just doesn't file the paperwork on the land records. Yeah, I just, I think that, you know, if, if you're looking at the ordinance, what the ordinance requires is those five spots for the two family and that to 
say that it's being used as a single family, even though it's uh, currently zoned and assessed um, as the as the two family that um, we'd need her to affirmative like like Linda say we need to affirmatively say that it's converted to a to a single family house. Um, and maybe as, well, as, and as Rachel pointed out, there are there are tax implications and maybe implications. maybe that makes sense to look into this and then revisit this, continue the hearing and, and revisit it or to come have her submit a new plan. But um, I, I I would encourage the board not to approve uh, something where then she has the opportunity, you know. She may or may not file it. Um, it would be just as easy to continue the hearing and then make that decision at the next the meeting. Other alternative is for her to apply for a variance to the parking requirements. And could we put a condition on that variance that if it the house reverts to a two-family use, she loses the variance? We're trying to find a way for the applicant because she has so few clients to do what she wants, but to do it legally. Mm -hmm. I'm apparently the first home hairstylist in East Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell my wife that. She cuts my hair. Well, every I'm three. the only one that's ever applied. It only became legal in 2016 in the state in the Commonwealth to do hair in your home in 2016. Well, um, you are our and first applicant. I've looked through. You got it. Uh, yes, and I, I've taken a lot of measures to be do my due diligence. I have a, a business owner's policy. I, I, I take this very seriously. And I, I would, mm -hmm. you know, um, I didn't realize this would even come into question. This is a very old house. I have a very private business. There will not be a lot of traffic in and out of my home. There won't even be a sign on my house. I, I look at this as the price of doing business and I, in good faith, um, am very happy to not have nuisance traffic in the street or parking. Now, we, we appreciate what you're doing and we applaud you for what you're doing, uh, but it's, it is a, it's a kind of one of those odd situations because it is fa because it is registered with the city as a two family home it then causes the necessity in order to meet the requirements of the ordinance uh, to be able to provide five I have a well, question. four parking so am i entitled to street parking jamie if i am required to have five spots does that mean i'm entitled to three spots on the street the, the ordinance requires you to provide two off-street parking spaces per, uh, per, per residential dwelling unit and one parking space for um, the uh, home occupation, one additional home space for the home occupation. They, they, by the ordinance, they all have to be off-street. I understand. So the point being this house never had those spaces as a two family. So um, I'm not really sure where this goes with that. I have a neighbor with nine cars in their driveway. It's a single family home divided into seven apartments. So, um, you know, how, how does this work? I, I don't know the tax implications. So I, I would be reticent to, to, you know, do anything with that. I would um, think you would be more reticent. I used to own a two family house. I lived in it. And I, it had value because it was a two family in its neighborhood as opposed to a single family. And so I, if I was you, I wouldn't, I would be more concerned about losing the two familyness of my house for the future rather than anything I'm else. Not, that's, I'm not sure what you'd like me to do. Um, my driveway is the size that it is. I, I don't plan to be, there's no high traffic coming in here. We keep one car here. Um, that won't ever change. I don't, there will not be any renters here. So 
So I, th I think that you, you may be, it, it may be in your best interest to, to discuss the, the long-term uh, benefit ramifications, whatever you want to call it, of, with the city of keeping it as a two-family home and then having to come back to the zoning board for variance or switching it to a single family home and then coming back at, and you know basically we could we could go ahead and, and move forward with your application and, and you know I, I think this is we're, we seem to be making a mountain out of a molehill but I, I firmly believe that you know you you don't want to jeopardize what you have in either situation and, and I I'm not here I can't give you judge I can't give you advice on what I would recommend you do I can only find based on or we the board can only find based on the information that we have based on the the way the property is is zoned taxed and what the zoning laws are in front of us. Wait, would a minimally would a minimally uh, obstructive path be for the applicant to file uh, a letter similar to the um, commentary she's already provided the, the her application where she formally says people could park in the driveway where she says so long as I operate this home business my intention is to operate this as my single family home and in no way rent or or vend a part of it for another occupant because then we would we would link the single family occupancy to the permit here and then should she want to change to a two family occupancy again um she would simply just surrender the home occupancy permit rather than needing to go through any longer process of getting the pro the property certified to have a particular use the challenge with that is the enforcement. It, the onus then comes on her that says, if she were to go ahead and rent that property, which would not require any further regulation from the city or, or, or uh, board or anything like that, uh, she could today, she could tomorrow, she couldn't five years rent it as a two family because it is a two family. And we would, the city would be none the wiser. And how would we know when that transaction happened and how, who would enforce the, hey, that can't happen because we've now triggered and gone from a single family occupancy in a two family to a two family occupancy in a two family. One possibility would be that when the ZBA reaches its decision, should they choose to approve, we can transmit this uh, the the decision to all the other departments, including the building department, where the applicant would need to pull the electrical permit to install a second meter, should there be an apartment unit put in. At the point at which that electrical unit was installed by the building department, or when the permits were pulled for that that work, any work to put in a new apartment, that would trigger the special permit condition, and they would put in the second unit and surrender the home occupation. The second unit is legally there today, so. They probably don't have oh. to do anything. There's probably already a second meter, you're saying? Yeah. Potentially. We actually don't have one hooked up. We don't have a second meter. But but it, you, even so, it's, you know, because it is zoned, because it is its current use on our all of our official assessments and things like that at the two family, the, the building inspector would not look twice at Okay, it's two family. They need a new, you know, they need a new uh, permit. They're just doing work interior to bring it up to code. It's not. Um, I, I don't think it would. It, they would. A, a building inspector would necessarily look back in the file to see that there was a, a special permit decision. I'm going to go back to my original suggestion that we approve this, with a condition that. If it starts being used as a two family, they cannot have a home occupation. And so we don't find out the first couple months. Eventually, someone, it will be found. I mean, enforcement's difficult for all sorts of conditions. That way, the applicant gets to do what she wants 
but we're covering ourselves as far as complying with the regulation. I don't see a downside to that. As with all of our applications, Linda, most of them come down to the ability for enforcement. Any other board members have any questions, thoughts? I'm just concerned that even though I want to agree with Linda's proposal, it's just the enforcement issue that is impossible. Yeah. Jared, thoughts? Um, I don't really have a problem with the condition. I think any condition you're gonna have an issue with enforcement, um, but I understand obviously it's complicated. <laughs> and I think that's the easiest solution given that it's currently being used as a single occupancy house. Um, if she wants to then change it back or use it as it's currently zoned as a two family house, um, that would be uh, against the condition that we'd be imposing and she'd have to essentially surrender the home occupation at that point. Um, that's, you know, that's kind of where I come down. Yeah, and I guess at any point that it becomes a two family home, the permit is not active anymore, you know, would be inactive. Right. So even if we don't know about it, it doesn't matter. Be, it almost doesn't matter because it's still an inactive use. Okay. Tony? Uh, I don't know. The, um... I mean, it sounds like the, the issue is with the with the parking thing because if it's a two if it's a two family, I don't know. Steve, no. The only thing I could uh, uh, think of is that perhaps if she has this rectified now, it'll help her with her present situation and any other future headaches that she may have. So it might be best off just to cross that bridge now, uh, get it properly classified and handle it from there. Okay. Is this, all right. Uh, is there anyone else here from the public, wherever you might be? I can just scroll over, see if there's anybody else here uh, who's here to talk concerning the application by Rachel Phillips. Okay. I. I'm torn, I have to say that. Because, you know, part of me says that as a two family home, it needs to have five spots in the driveway. And even though it's, it, it has more to do with what it is zoned for and currently approved for. And then by approving additional usage it's in, in all essence, it's becoming more non-compliant. If this was a front or side yard setback and we said, sure, you're already close to the line, but you know, you're, you're, you're supposed to have five feet and you're already two feet over, but we'll let you do another one. We would never do that. That would have to have a variance and that would require all the I's be dotted and the T's be crossed and everything along those lines. And in, in my opinion, um, that's not the way we're supposed to be. We are supposed to follow the rules and the regulations. And if it is currently zoned as a two family home, then technically it should have 
four off street parking spots. And the desire to have a home business would then require an additional spot. And I think that that is kind of where the roadblock starts. As much as I would love to approve it, I, I appreciate the thought and the wanting to do it at home business and all of it. I, I just, I have a hard time as the Zoning Board of Appeals or a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals to say, yeah, you can do it, but if you all of a sudden you decide to keep going, then you need to come back or you need to stop. That's not really the way we're supposed to do it. You know, I'm very happy to surrender my permit if I ever decide to use this as a two-family. I, I do my due diligence. I, I chair a municipal committee. I did this to be on the up and up. Um, and quite frankly, I don't want to pay another $400 to do this again. I'm very happy to surrender the, the home business light certificate if, if I ever did decide to use this actually as a two-family. Okay, so at this point, let's let's close the public hearing and and discuss further. And can I um, make a interject before before you um, go too far? Um, if it's looking like the board is going to deny this special permit, I I would request that the hearing be continued instead to December to give us time to work with the applicant and discuss how we might be able to rectify and figure out a way forward um, and rediscuss to, to, to continue it to December. Um, that way there's not a, um, she won't be, she won't have to reapply and spend additional permitting fees. Um, Okay, can I recommend, John, that we keep the public hearing open? You made a motion to close it. We keep it open and with the applicant's consent. Rachel, is it all right to continue to December? I'm not sure I have a choice. <laughs> I can't hear. I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that, I, that there's, is there another option? I'm yeah, gonna... Jamie wants to work with you to find out, to try to solve this problem. So it's either cost. dis. So it, the the option is December or just a decision right now. I would go with December, I guess. Yeah, I I would recommend going to December because it's gonna it's gonna allow, you know, let's let's figure out you know the best way that you know you know you want to open your business and we want you to open your business, uh, but we need to make sure that. It's, you know, you've come this far on the up and up and we want to make sure that it continues that way. So with your, with your consent, we're going to uh, leave the open hearing open, the, the, uh, the public portion of the meeting open. Uh, and, uh, you know, at this point, come back in December and continue forward. I, I second that. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then can we get a roll call vote again? Tony? I'm okay with that. Steve? Yes, I agree. Linda? Yes. Lindsay? Yes. Jared? Yes. And I agree as well. Okay. We, Rachel, we appreciate you working with us and we hope that we're tr we really are trying to work with you. I know it doesn't sound that way and, and I'm sure it doesn't sound that way, but we really do want you to open your business. I, I, I'm very excited to be the first home hairstylist in East Hampton. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, can we will I, see you in I, December. Can I chime in really quick? Um, I joined this meeting for the other hearing that's uh, on Pleasant Street. Um, I didn't, I live on Pleasant Street. I didn't know about Rachel's business. 
Rachel, I use a hairstylist in South Hadley, but you're right down the street from me. I just want you to know, I can walk to you. I don't need a parking space. I'd be glad <laughs> to walk to your location and have my hair done. Just, I'm you're, just you're saying. You're a kind lady. I, I appreciate your candor. I, and I, I have you. some people that live around me that would walk to you as well. I just want to say it. I, I hear you and I, I do know many of my neighbors and I, I, I appreciate your candor and I, I hope your, your hearing goes well. <laughs> Um, I am well, I'm just here because though. I'm, I'm, I'm not here. I'm not have a business that I'm, I live next door to a business that they're going to talk uh, about, but I didn't know about you, but I'd be happy to, uh, you're kind, you the irony and I, will, being, I don't need a parking space is what I'm saying. The irony being is no one can come see me unless. I tell them they can because there will be no sign. This will this will be the, the most private uh I, I will find you. going. I will find you okay. without a sign. Well, thank you, Joan. I'm gonna I I will I will we'll maybe we'll we'll talk later. And um I'm looking forward to seeing you all again in December. Thanks, Jamie. Right. I appreciate okay. this. The the all December right. meeting is gonna be um December 16th. December 6th. Yeah. So it's 6, 6 p.m. And the Zoom information will be on the um, agenda that goes out and will be posted on the city's website um, for anyone, members of the public who are watching this and want to participate on the December 16th meeting. Um, the agenda will be on the city's website, easthamptonma.gov, uh, the Thursday preceding the meeting. Okay. All right. So at this point, we don't close the meeting. We don't close that meeting. So we we start another one. Try to keep all this straight. All right. Where's my agenda? Hold on. Bear with me here, people. Um, so at this point, we open a public hearing for Chris Rogers seeking a special permit under section 12.7 of the East Hampton Zoning Board, the Zoning Ordinance, to operate a commercial establishment with uses retail and service, number 10, a restaurant and bar, and number 40, indoor recreation. The property is located at 105 Pleasant Street in the neighborhood business zoning district. Okay, Mr. Rogers, are you here to speak? Chris, right. this is Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group. I know Chris Rogers is, is attending the meeting, um, but I, I'm certainly here to speak on his behalf if he's not available to say anything at the moment. Um, I see he's still on mute, so I'm not yep. going to give him a second. Otherwise, I can introduce okay, can you. Can hear me now? This is Chris Rogers. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. All right, Chris, what are you looking to do? We have your application that we received, and then uh, two hours ago, we got updated submittal information. Um, uh, but and and I will I will be the first to tell you that I have not had a chance to review the updated information, so I can only go on the original information that I received last week. Um, so with that said, let's start with the the general consensus of what you're trying to do, and and we can go from there. Sure. Um... Our purpose is to uh, build a billiard hall um, for the purpose of uh, pool leagues and, and for the general public to come and enjoy um, some pool at our facility. And uh, there will be a uh, bar in the, uh, in the building as well. Um, as far as any uh, intricacies of that. I'm going to leave that to 
Mr. Squire. Sure. Okay. So, um, Can I ask before we begin, when did we get revised plans? I don't have revised plans. If this, I can provide if I can provide a little bit of commentary to that with uh, both the boards and the applicants per, uh, permission. So um, uh, Member Bush, this the we received plans today at 143 uh, in response to the technical memo that I forwarded to the board on Thursday of last week. Um, these are supplementary to the original plans that were submitted and uh, were forwarded to the board last week as well. Um, uh, Jeff Squire as the applicant's representative, I'd be more than happy to give you screen share permissions to go go through the plans with the permission and desire of the board if the board signals that that's something that they would like. Um, and if you wouldn't mind going through the original plan set and then uh, with the board's permission going through the updated plan set if the board would like. But that, that uh, does that make sense to you, Member Bush, what, what I'm saying here? So no, because I like to look at it. I have, okay. I've been on the board eight years, and I believe this is the first new construction that's come before the Zoning Board of Appeals. We're not used to looking at site plans, looking at parking, landscaping. That's just not something we ever do. As I said, I've been on eight years, and I think this is the first. Why the zoning regulations are written this way, I don't know, but I didn't write them. Um, and I have some issues with the plan. Um, and I just like to look at it. I think um, the front yard parking shouldn't be there. And I don't know if that's been corrected. The parking spaces are too small. And I'm wondering if the building is just a little too big for this particular site. Okay, so so I guess, you know, do we at this point say, you know, if, if the original application came through and we've had a chance to review it and, and then even within that time frame, with, when the technical memo came out, uh, the applicant has decided to amend that application or address the concerns that were brought up in that technical memo. Uh, what we have not been at the board has not been given due time and, and, and to, to review, discuss, uh, look at the, any, any updated technical uh, commentary by the planning department. Um, and I don't even know if you, if the planning department has had a chance to review what was resubmitted or amended or, or proposed. Uh, I, I think it may be in everyone's best interest to, to stop now and say, let's, let's, you know, hold the, hold the horse and, and come back in December and review it once rather than go through what was submitted with the caveat saying, well, yeah, but we're going to change that. No, we're going to change this. Let's, let's look at it once with what has been now proposed as of, I believe you said one something there, or two something this afternoon. And, and then we can look at it, we can print it out, we can digest it and know what we're talking about really. Does that make sense to people? Jeff? Can I just make one comment? The, the only change in addition, I mean, the, the, the submission this afternoon was really just answers or responses to the comments. It was, you know, I'm happy to go through those, but most of them are just, you know, general comments to, to the responses that came out of, um, you know, the, the uh, planning department. The only substantive plan change was the addition of four bike racks. Everything else on the site is exactly the same as what you've already seen. So, so we you're just taking the parking in the front yard. So this this is what we wanted to discuss tonight and part See, of that. I think that's inappropriate. I think that's uh, the Linda, building. Linda, Linda, we, we haven't even given the applicant a chance to explain what he'd like to do. So so we have to we have to give the applicant a chance before we, we go there. But let's, you know, let's, you know, is it, it, I'm okay to proceed. 
But I want, let, let me put it to you this way. I don't see us making a decision this evening based on the fact that we have, oh, we, we have, you know, answers or, 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 you know, we already have concerns. Um, and obviously parking is one of them. Um, so I think that, you know, if you want, we can give you, you know, a half an hour or, or 40 minutes and we can discuss this. But I think we need to look at, you know, and maybe we can go back and, and you'll, at that point, you're going to have a list of things that we have concerned about and you can go ahead and address them to, to come back next meeting, next meeting. Uh, I'm okay with that, but I want you, I, I don't want the understanding to say that we're going to move forward with the hearing and that the, that you're going to try to pull, you know, we're, we're going to all of a sudden get something approved or, or the idea of moving forward is based on what is now being presented, if that makes sense. Yeah, understood. I mean, we, we still have to go back to Conservation Commission um, where, you know, we'd certainly acknowledge that this may not be closed or a decision may not be made tonight. Um, I think, you know, again, the, the plan changes are really insubstantial compared to the overall site. Um, and in addition to just providing some responses to, to staff comments, um, you know, really, we just wanted to present the project to the board tonight um, and, um, you know, get some of your feedback and comments so that, you know, as you pointed out, John, if there's other revisions or other things that we need to consider, then we can incorporate those, you know, prior to the next, the, the next hearing. Okay. And you All know, right, so planning staff had had the opportunity to review and, and I've had a chance to look it over. So I'm, I'm, I'm whatever the board uh, wants to do, I'm completely comfortable with. Okay, Curtis, I appreciate the insight. Um, uh, may I, I see Joan has her hand up and I'm not sure are you, are you a, are you a part of the applicant? Are you part no, of- No, I'm uh no, I'm actually kind of nobody. I live um, exactly next door to where, uh, this is why I'm here tonight. I wanted to, I live next door to where they want to put this, which sounds great, and you're talking about the plans. I guess my question is, is there a place, is there somewhere I can go online to see what the plans, what the perspective plans are to see what, I live literally right next door to where they want, where this is gonna go. Oh, so I, so I live at Manhattan condominiums, which is 111 to 113 Pleasant Street. I'm the, the association president and I drew the short, star, short straw of my, of the people in our uh, community to be here tonight. So aren't you lucky? Um, and I, although it's great that I'm all for business going next door, there's a question as to, you know, what are the plans? So um, can I answer that? Is there, oh. is there someplace where I can see yeah. what is being yep. Yep. Um, proposed? So, if you'll, um, so you, you, I assume you, your condominium association received a postcard in the mail notifying you of the hearing, which is why you're here. There I, was a, um, right a here? line, there is a, on that postcard, it does say that uh, you can go to easthamptonma.gov slash ZBA um, and all of the permitted uh, applications um, and decisions when they're uh, finally drafted get posted uh, on that um, it does not say, my postcard does not give that information. Okay, well, I, I have to apologize for that, that- um, That's all right, that's fine, uh, but if okay. You, if, you, if, you, if, if you go to easthamptonma.gov slash ZBA, the applications are posted there. I'm sorry, can you please repeat that uh, website? easthamptonma.gov slash ZBA. East Hampton, I'm sorry. East Hampton, MA dot gov slash yeah. ZBA. East Hampton, MA dot gov slash ZBA. ZEA, okay. No, ZBA, like Zoning Board of Appeals, ZBA. ZBA, okay. Okay. 
And that will give me the give us the information as to what's being proposed. There, there's a link on that page to the uh, applications and decisions that are open. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to disrupt. No, that's okay. All right. So, at this point, Jeff, if you'd like to go ahead and review what you have planned. Um, Curtis, if he requests any time of type of screen share or something like that, we can do that. Um, you know, but I let's for for intents and purposes, let's say that we're gonna we're gonna call the um, we're, we're gonna call the meeting at seven thirty with the idea that you know I think we all are in agreement that there's changes that are being made, but I want to make sure that we get what we're supposed to. Uh, so I would like to, you know, I'd like to be done for the day. Been working for quite a few hours already. So, so let's, Jeff, go ahead. What do you got? What do you have in mind? Great. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, Jeff Squire, uh, uh, Landscape Architect and Principal at, at Berkshire Design Group. We are here on behalf of Chris Rogers for um, the application at 105 Pleasant Street. Um, I'll real quickly just run through these um, in the interest of time. Um, but this this roughly is the is the outline of the parcel. It's about a one acre parcel, just under a one acre parcel, um, directly across from the East, East Works building. Um, it's uh, the site of a former filling station. Um, you know, the, the existing site really is, um, you know, built out to, I'll go back to this one. There's this front portion of the site where you see um, the paved area that used to be there for the, for the gas station is all relatively level. From that point to the north, it drops steeply down to, um, you know, down to a, a level area about 30 feet below um, the elevation along Pleasant Street. Um, there's there's some resource areas and wetlands back there, which has prompted the you know, our submission to the Conservation Commission, and we're currently working through um, some of those permit, permit uh, questions. So a couple of edges of the site, the rest of the um, again, Eastworks building, the background here, um, you can see it really covered with, with asphalt or concrete, the remnants of what was an old gas station. Um, down the hill in the back, you can see um, this, this is looking to the east, northeast, I guess, toward the apartment buildings or condominiums. Um, and still the hill drops off, you know, steeply to the, to the left, you can see this looking down in the back toward the level area um, behind the site that really is inaccessible and undevelopable. Uh, again, existing conditions plan showing you the upper portion of the site. Um, of the entire, you know, one acre roughly site, um, you know, a little less than half is, is really developable. Um, and so um, that just gives you a, a, an idea of the site. Um, the proposal is to construct a single story billiards hall, uh, roughly 3,700 square feet um, on what used to be the, the former filling station um, area. Uh, Parking lot off to the, um, off the right side of the site, um, trying to crosswalks um, across Pleasant Street from East Works, uh, recognizing there's a bus stop uh, across the street on Pleasant Street, um, and trying to maintain you know adequate distance from from adjacent curb cuts and and other uses. Um, the, the, the project overall is a, is a net decrease in impervious area from what was there. Um, we've dropped about a third of, of what used to be covered with asphalt or, or you know, concrete. Um, we've got a large rain garden out in the front as a, both a landscape feature and a way to um, attenuate some of the, the roof water. Um, there is a stormwater system proposed underneath the parking lot to handle the parking lot drainage um, with a discharge out back. Again, we're going through conservation commission with, um, you know, with, with all of those um, items. Um, I won't spare, I won't, won't dwell too much on, on the plan set, um, but again, it gives you the rough dimensions of the lay uh, of, the, of, the, of the site. 
Um, uh, you know, we can go through some of the discussions in the staff comments um, at the end, but, um, you know, one of the things I, I will note um, or have noted, uh, particularly with parking is, you know, so the requirements we, um, in discussions with staff, um, when this project was originally being considered for, for submission to the town, um, discussions with staff had classified this building as an amusement facility, um, which required by zoning, uh, I think 19 spaces um, for the square footage. Um, we've got 17 um, and under 10.51, uh, there are some provisions that and then this is the sort of the odd thing with this project is that it requires zoning board approval, not planning board, um, but it does grant the planning board approval to, to waive some of the requirements based on topography and other site constraints. And we certainly feel that this site um, you know, qualifies as, as one of having substantial constraints with respect to grading and resource areas and adjacent sites. Um, you know, one of the things I will note that um, you know, to the, uh, to the east, uh, toward the apartment buildings. Uh, you can see, I'll go back to the existing conditions plan. Um, actually, you can see it, but there's actually an encroachment um, from the adjacent site. There are this portion of asphalt here. They've got a stockade fence. The parking for the adjacent site is actually encroaching on this site. So we're trying to accommodate, um, you know, some of those uh, nuances with with development and the way that, that, that Pleasant Street has, um, you know, been developed over the years. Uh, we're not proposing to remove that or take that away. We've, you know, one of the reasons this site is designed as it is is because we're trying to take into consideration that encroachment is not uses. Um, we are showing spaces that are nine by 18 as opposed to nine by 20. And again, one of the comments um, or responses to, to the comments in the end is that, um, you know, we've, we've been in business as civil engineers and landscape architects for almost 32 years now. 95% um, of our parking lots are designed, you know, 60 feet from curb to curb with eight with nine by 18 foot parking spaces and a 24 foot parking aisle and, you know, all, nearly all commercial and, and residential um, situations applications and um, it's we've we've found this to be more than adequate to ensure, you know, the safety um, of both um, vehicles pulling in and out and also the ability to park, you know, both small and, and large vehicles in a lot. So that is, you know, one of the um, those, those two items are noted as being um, uh, uh, something that we're requesting, you know, waiver or variance from from the zoning board. Um, uh, sanitary, all of those are very easy connect to the street, transformer, and the rain garden as a as a back of the building that's proposed um, as a as an additional uh, you know site feature. Um, we did provide a site photometric plan. There are four site lights proposed at the parking lot. Um, again, just demonstrating that we are in compliance with with the zoning regulations, uh, zoning ordinance for uh, you know low low cutoff or full cutoff fixtures, dark sky compliant. Uh, these are, you know, high, high efficiency LED, uh, um, and then again, the rest of the set is uh, primarily uh, details, elevation showing you the various elevations of the building, um, this being the predominant one um, from Pleasant Street. Um, you can see in the back, the deck, the, end, the main entryway and the northeast uh, elevation of the site. Uh, and again, a, 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 you know, a, a photo rendering um, of what the entryway and the front uh, signage is, is depicted as um, you know, the front of the building. Um, again, I'm happy to run through some of these, these responses. Um, you know, a couple of them, the first couple of really deal with um, you know, the, the parking issues that I mentioned before, um, the first comment was just about the, the property ownership listed in the assessor's database. The, the applicant has actually since closed on that property. 
Um, so they actually do own the property now. It's not, it's no longer Burke Realty Trust. Um, the number two and number three really deal with the um, various uh, park parking stall requirements that I, I discussed earlier. Um, the um, number four was just requesting dimensions of the sign. So those are, those are provided um, certainly in compliance with, with all the regulations. Um, and just again, acknowledging that the project requires review from the conservation commission. Um, you know, one of the, the other things that we had noted in the, um, in the discussion about parking spaces was that this project, um, you know, is in a neighborhood business district. It's surrounded by other uses and businesses that are, you know, similar in, in um, you know, in, in use and, and nature of parking along Pleasant Street is the majority of, of parking. Um, if you look up and down Pleasant Street, all are within, um, you know, feet, if not, um, you know, right on the property line. So we certainly, um, you know, acknowledge the, the, um, the, the type of development that's occurred along uh, Pleasant Street and they're trying to be cognizant of that and respective of, of you know, both those um, um, uh, uh, standards and, and um, the, the zoning ordinance. The, the plan change that I referred to earlier was really the addition of um, these four bike racks that you see out in the front of the building. Again, being located in a, in a downtown uh, neighborhood business district with easy access to uh, the bike path and residential units, the anticipation is that you know, several people will certainly you know, walk or, or ride bikes here. Um, there's, there's parking, public parking available on Pleasant Street and the owner is currently in discussions with some of the uh, some of the adjacent property owners for uh, shared parking opportunities, and um, that that's you know that, that's something that's ongoing. Um, we recognize that in the ordinance, it, it certainly speaks to the possibility of shared parking on adjacent or nearby sites, and that's something that the applicant is is currently pursuing. Has got a tentative agreement with a with an adjacent owner. For um, you know, for some additional parking spaces. So um, I think all of those things combined um, really, really justified um, you know our rationale behind the reduction of of parking by um, by two spaces um, and um, and allowing you know the the possibility for for two parking spaces to be located within the front setback. Um, again, typically it's, it's reserved for structures and, and buildings, but um, certainly recognize that these zoning ordinance, uh, particularly for this district, for whatever reason prohibits parking within the front setback. Um, and I think I will leave it at that. Um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions, um, any concerns or anything else that we can answer for the board. Okay. Um, so, uh, if we could take that off screen share, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. That's okay. You may be asked to pull that back up at some point. So I don't go too far with it, Jeff. Uh, having now seen everything, um, is this going to be a little weird? But my thought is, is the board has all had a chance to review the initial set for the most part uh, because they received that link. Um, my thought is, is to at this point open it to the public and ask if there was any questions that the public may have uh, in an effort to, you know, if we, if we feel we're not going to make a decision this evening and in an effort to maximize the ability for the applicant to get questions answered, situations resolved, let's find out who of the public or what questions the public may have in concern with that. And I have Jamie raving her hand. <laughs> I, I would just like to reiterate, um, 
for public speak, please state your name and address for the record so we get you properly entered into the minutes. Um, and also to direct all of your comments or questions or concerns to the board. Um, the board will um, redirect to the applicant or the representative as required. So just that there's not a lot of crosstalk between uh, members of the public and the applicants too. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so let me scroll over here and I see I see Will Bundy is there. I don't know if anybody else is here from the board, from the public. So, Will, did you have any questions that you have for at this point, or are you going to address those with a letter? How would you like to go from there? I, I, I well, I have questions. Sure, and well, concerns. even though we know who you are, go ahead, you have to state your name. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Will Bundy, I am the owner of Eastworks at 116 Pleasant Street. And um, and I just have a number of concerns. I think, you know, aesthetically and everything that Chris is bringing to this project, it, it looks lovely. But um, I feel like the cranky old man that's always talking about parking, uh, my life seems to ride on it. And, um, and so bear with me. Um, I, I'm gonna start backwards. I just heard, um, Jeffrey talk about uh, how there was there was an adequate parking and there was going to be reaching out and talking to someone about a situation which parking could be made available. Um, and I just want to say right now that my issue with that as a solution is that that's temporary. Uh, there is no one who is going to offer Chris a permanent solution the dynamic of change that's happening on Pleasant Street, just for backgrounders, are pre-COVID and post-COVID, the amount of street parking is absolutely intense. And I think that Jim Whitmer could certainly talk to this in terms of the dynamic of, of what's going on in the Mill District and how active this on-street parking is. And, um, My, my issues aren't as related to my own property, but they are in that I have 70,000 square feet. I am still developing, but it's also an awareness that the mill district has in total a couple of hundred thousand square feet still to come online. And the truth is, is a lot of that's gonna come onto the street as well. So I have questions about parking as it pertains to the neighborhood. As to this plan specifically, um, you know, we both, uh, um, Shay Blaisdell and I, who is also your cog on your screen there, she and I have, have, have worked with Chris because at one time he was thinking of being over at Eastwork. So we're really aware of the dynamism of his vision. He is really creating not just your bar and billiard hall, he is creating a destination site with tying in uh, leagues and doing very dynamic things. I think it's, it's really laudable and a great plan and I'm sorry we didn't get him, but, but as I look at the plan that Jeffrey's put together, 17 parking spaces and a side deal that is not gonna last seems woefully kind of short of what's needed. I mean, just following, and, and here you guys can help me, um, just following the, if we just follow the criteria for amusement, which is 150 square feet per space, is that right, Jeffrey? That's a nod, okay. So if, if the building is 3,700 square feet, that, that puts you at 20 some odd spaces, like 24, is that correct? Okay, Will, we, we're gonna ask yeah. that you address- Okay, yeah. okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah You're yeah, supposed yeah. to address okay. those so, questions. Yeah. Sorry, oh, not yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just don't spend enough time with you guys, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. That. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so, so my question to the board is, is if you use the 150 from my reading of it, that's like 24 spaces. 
if you use the seating, and that's just the interior of the building, that isn't including the deck. The deck is the, I'll get to the deck. But if you do that, it's 24 plus. And, but if you look at the seating that they've designed in there, um, it's, it, it looks like it's about 80 some odd plus seating. And, um, and that's 20 spots, but you're also um, then looking at the deck and the deck doesn't even have all the seating into it that might be possibly there. I mean, it, at fresh count, it's like 33 spots, but you, you, you look at all the space that's left an, empty on the plan and it could literally be almost another 30 seats. Um, if you do your 150, either calculation of like what I see as potential seating in this establishment or what you can do and if you divide the 150 into it is you, you're really needing closer to 30. And in truth, I don't really think that's, that's enough, but that's, I don't write the zoning rules. And so, and so those are my questions. My questions are, our capacity. My questions are, does the zoning board accept the idea of a temporary solution? And um, I think this is going to be a very big thing if it happens. And I think the impact on the neighborhood in terms of parking is, is, is going to be problematic. Um, and and um, I'm sorry to, to have to say those things in this meeting because I really do think that the idea that Chris is pursuing is a really good one, but I see huge problems for the neighborhood. So, thank you. Okay. All right, is there anyone else from the public who's interested in speaking? Okay. Um, Tony, I'm going to tap into your repertoire of, of information. Um, bathrooms in a public location are based on occupancy, correct? Yes. Occupancy, occupancy and use, yeah. Occupancy and use. Mm. And if you look at the plan that we have in front of us, it shows one, two, three, four ladies and two urinals and two toilets on the men's side. And so that kind of is dictating the occupancy. Would you not say that? Um, yeah, but without, you know, sitting down and actually doing a, a calculation just by like looking at this size of the building because the square footage has... Yeah a lot to do with that um sure. i think that it's uh probably more than enough but you would say that the occupancy of the building exceeds the occupancy of the parking lot um i don't know i don't know uh, I, I, it's i mean it's you know it's uh I'm not sure. No. Well, and you know, at, at quick count, I see, you know, 35 seats outside, uh, two, four, six, eight, 10 bar stools, 10 pool tables with the expectation that two people would be playing pool at each table. Some quick math here, that's 65 people. And your occupancy of your parking lot doesn't quite come close to that. Can Would I just, that be a safe bet? Can I just offer something real quick? Is that we're, you know, we're, we're I mean, the, the zoning ordinance requires parking spaces, you know, predicated on you know, gross square footage or net square footage, depending on what the use is, not not necessarily occupancy. You know, th there's there's an occupancy for for all buildings, all structures for the building code, 
but the right. zoning ordinances doesn't necessarily dictate the number of parking spaces that are required based on occupancy necessarily. It may it may have to do with staff or you know some other calculations, but I, I typically don't see parking regulations being dictated by overall building occupancy because it's just, you know, it's not a feasible way to, concert hall has, you know, occupancy of thousands and thousands of people or, you know, a, so anyway, I, it, the zoning ordinance requires parking based on a different calculation. But even if we used a different calculation and divided it up into the, the pool hall part and the bar part as two separate entities, and I think they could be used that way. And then you have the deck, which to me adds square footage because people are gonna sit out there and drink. You need more parking. Well, and, and I Just think- for those it, uses. Yeah, I mean, you, you bring up an interesting point, Linda, is that you know, if, if the building is you know, a mixed use, for lack of a better term, of, a entertain, of an amusement area, and a bar area, does it need a, a very, you know, kind of a combination of both? I think it does. And I don't, and when you commented on the parking in the front yard, because all the existing buildings have parking in the front yard, all the existing buildings are a hundred years old. And I, I don't think it's fair to compare new construction to a hundred year old factory building. I like landscaping. Well, it's, it's, I mean, no, it's no different than anything else, anything else on the street. So you're trying to yeah. make it like it's a house. I mean, look what's across the street, East Works. The parking is right up to the curb. Yeah, yeah, but it's um, next to a residential structure. I'd point out the, the the existing site too has has asphalt all the way up to you know right to the property line and all I mean mm -hmm. that that entire upper portion of the site was was paved previously, so it's not it's not like we're taking away green space. It's it was all previously, you know, existing. Yeah, and, I, and I, you know the the your effort to reduce the amount of impervious, you know, area on the site I think is is definitely noted, Jeff. And you know, obviously, the the topography of the site does dictate that you can only go back so far. And the site may be larger, but you can only go so far on the site. So, I just I would just like to point out um, our ordinance. the The parking requirements are minimums, not maximums. And for any special permit application, the board is. Uh, it's within their purview to require additional parking spaces uh, beyond what is uh, suggested in the, as a minimum parking requirement. So, um. I can see the owner of Eastworks having issues because when I went to the site yesterday, I parked in Eastwork parking because there are parking spaces there. The ones right next door that, you know, the big empty parking lot. And so I'm assuming that Eastworks has a right to be concerned about overflow from this use onto their property because they want to provide parking spaces for their tenants. That's yep. not our problem. I well, think it is if we approve it. Well, and this is where, this is why we're here and we're going to have a reasonable conversation about it. And, you know, it is, I think it's our job or, or, or responsibility to make a, a valid decision and understanding of how the parking is supposed to happen on site. Um, Jeff, you made indication of negotiations or possible agreements with neighbors for parking. Um, I think there, you know, a question I have is how that will work long term, and what discussions have been had pertaining to that working long term. 
Yeah, I don't I don't know the specifics of you know what's been discussed other than I know there's some tentative agreements with you know with some adjacent landowner for a certain number of spaces. Um, you know, our my experience in similar situations like this is it's you know it's some sort of lease agreement or or easement agreement um, that's you know renewed um, on um, you know on a on a certain timeline. Um, it really depends on the agreement with the, between the two property owners. Okay. And speaking of easement, um, you did bring note that the uh, property to the east, the existing parking lot, does infringe on your property on the property. Correct. Um, obviously, you know, I'm sure that was covered in the deed and everything along those lines. How, um, you know. How is that being addressed long term? So, you know, at least at least with the plans that are before you, um, you know, the proposal is to leave everything, you know, in place as it is. Um, you know, Chris would have to speak, the applicant would have to speak to any, you know, formal legal agreements that, um, you know, might be might be in discussions with with that property owner for use of that property or, or that land. Um, but insofar as um, you know, how it affects or impacts this site or this project, um, you know, we're proposing to leave all that in place um, so as not to you know, create any more waves than we need to. It's, you know, we're not trying to disrupt the neighborhood. We're trying to you know, develop a, a, a site that um, you know, was, was previously a gas station and, and provide a little bit of um, um, you know, activity in, in, that, in, in that portion of, of Pleasant Street. So certainly being cognizant of, of the neighbors. Okay. Has it been determined what the maximum people capacity of that building would be? That would be deemed by the square footage and the fire department would determine that number. All right, so there's going to be league nights, correct? For the pool, there'll be league nights, which will bring in a, a large influx of people. I would think so. So those nights, do you feel that the uh, current parking spaces that are available, would that take care of such an overflow of people? Uh, and another thing is if you are coming in, in from out of town, how are you gonna be aware of the other neighbor, uh, neighboring parking lots that would be available to you? If I'm coming in from out of town, I may not even be aware Jeff, how is the how is the owner planning on dispersing this type of information? Well, I don't I mean until an agreement is is you know formally established. I don't know as though there's you know we really have a definitive plan. What you know what I can say is again based on my experience, typically these these offsite you know parking um, parking arrangements are. Um, you know, they're both dedicated to staff parking. So that's where the staff parks, you know, the, the, the lot, you know, closest to the building, the facility is reserved for the public. So to the extent that, you know, any of the staff can park over there, that's where they'll park. Um, you know, the other things we've seen at, at other um, establishments is, you know, there'll be, there'll be signs at the door or on their website or, you know, otherwise just directing them, you know, where overflow parking might be. Available, but typically it's you know it's really reserved for staff and the folks that you know frequent the the establishment uh, more often um, is is you know typically what we've seen. Okay. So would those parking spaces be available to the staff and people who are working there that night, or would they be parking off site? I, I honestly can't, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think if, if they reach an agreement off site with, with an adjacent property owner, the, um, you know, the, the, the first task would be to assign those spaces to any of the staff or employees that are working during certain shifts. If there's leftover spaces, um, you know, uh, like I said, the, the folks that frequent the, the, the business, you know, most often would certainly be aware of those and, you know, ideally utilize those spaces and the rest of the spaces would be reserved for the general public. But, um, 
yeah, I mean, until until a formal agreement is is established or reached, um, you know, I can't speak to you know the specifics of anything. <clears throat> Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I think that, you know, the capacity of the building, you know, we understand that, you know, that shouldn't dictate the parking, but I definitely feel that it needs to, you know, we have seen at more than one location in the city where a building exceeds its capacity and then parking becomes a problem. And we're not gonna bring up any names here. Uh, so the, the capacity of, of the parking lot as drawn is very small. And I think that we're gonna need to get some additional idea of what sort of off premise parking agreements have been met even if even if in preliminary stages you know that's definitely going to be a, a key part of moving this project forward um the the thought of the parking in the front yard i'm not crazy about it but i understand that it is in yeah, is it any more detrimental to the neighborhood than what's in, in the rest of the neighborhood? As Tony said, no, it matches what's in the rest of the neighborhood. <laughs> um, so, you know, it would, it would look odd for lack of a better term if there was, you know, a, a grand entrance way. Um, so that being said, you know, I, I'm not crazy about it, but I, I'm not gonna, you know, we're, we're going to have to address it with a variance of some sort. And, you know, that that is not an unreasonable feat. Uh, but I, just, I, I, I am greatly concerned about the lack of parking on site. Yeah, I just keep thinking that with 10 pool tables, two people at a table when there's a competition, that's 20 people. How many people are gonna be coming together? So automatically, as soon as you have a competition night, the parking lot's full before all the competitors even arrive. And you have people sitting at the bar waiting for a table. Yeah, and people watching the pool competition, you know, so it's not, there's not even enough space for the people to participate to park, you know, so. Yeah, at, at 16 spots, well, 17, because we'll count the, we will count the handicap spot. Yeah, even at that, I mean, yes, if each person had a four person car, yeah, that gives you a capacity of, you know, 68 people. Uh, it's not a reasonable, it's not a reasonable math equation. Uh, and, and that's why I'm really, I really think that the board needs to see what kind of agreements have been, have been brought forward uh, by way of finding additional parking in the area. Um, and I think that Will brings up a very valid point that the area itself has a parking problem and he has the biggest parking lot. Yeah, that, that should tell you something when the guy who has the biggest parking lot is saying there's a parking problem. But that's a city problem and, and it should be addressed on the city side, not necessarily all pushed on one person's back. Uh, so does the, do any other board members have questions or concerns that they would like to see addressed that have not been addressed currently? I actually, uh, I'm, Curtis. I have a, I have a comment as a, oh, it looks like we have a member of the public. I'll, I'll hold oh. off, off on my comment. Okay. Member of the public. Uh, hi folks. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. I've been having some Wait. technical difficulties with my computer. Yep. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. So 
Uh, Jim Whitmer. Uh, I'm at 122 Pleasant Street in East Hampton. I'm the owner of Keystone Mill Building. Uh, I'm Will Bundy's next door neighbor. Um, I uh, find myself in the uh, unique position of pretty much agreeing with everything Will Bundy just said. Uh, um, <laughs> any any pressure, uh, and, I, and I'll tell you, we've we've had this. I've had conversations, similar conversations, with uh, prospective tenants who were looking into. Um, we're looking into opening a, a, not a similar organization or a similar, similar company, but one that was going to bring in a large number of members of the public that were going to require a lot of parking. Uh, we, even now we have, we have an event room that, that does put strain on the, the parking lot and on the street parking as it is. So I, I would just reiterate and affirm everything that, that Mr. Bundy just expressed as far as wanting to have a a uh, conscientious approach uh, to uh, parking is always not just on Will Bundy's mind, also on my mind, on I'm sure the other owners' minds, but if there is a dearth of it around the mills for our tenants and for their customers. Uh, and I just wanted to just sort of throw my two cents in there and say that it, it certainly is an issue that puts pressure on the commercial end of things that's on Pleasant Street. And we're we're making do and we're doing fine, but he's also 100% uh, correct in his analysis of the open space that is left to be brought online. We, we have several hundred thousand square feet that probably, uh, that will again put additional parking tra traffic pressure on the street. So any any one individual, particularly a smaller location where you are, where you are uh, intensifying or, or condensing uh, that, that traffic flow uh, into a single spot, uh, say, for example, if the uh, if you were to be, you know, if, if a business was to be operating at mass capacity and there was you know, 100 people there or 200 people there, you know, you're talking about several hundred cars uh, descending upon Pleasant Street or exiting Pleasant Street all at the same time. So I, I think it's a it's a it's a great idea. I, I agree with Will on that as well. And it, it, I don't I think it fits nicely in with what's going on uh, on Pleasant Street. But I would just say uh, that parking should be, I would think, very carefully considered in uh, and uh, I, I'd be interested. I haven't read it. And I apologize for not doing so before attending the meeting, but I, I wanted to read the traffic study and I have not done so and I, I will. Uh, but that's that really just wanted to put my two cents there. Thank you. Thank you. I know that the board was just commenting that they wanted to be concluding by 730. So I wanted to add a last note. Um, per uh 10.511c in our zoning ordinances the it says the planning board but it's really the special permit granting authority which in this case is y'all the the zoning board of appeals may grant a waiver for uh up to 20 percent of total required parking on premises for uh plans which make a long-term commitment to actively promote employee and public use of transit ride sharing and other means to reduce single occupancy vehicle travel um that i I just want to um, not take the temperature of the board, but just raise that to everybody's attention. If the board has any opinions on the matter and suggestions as to how the applicant might go about it, uh, the the applicant may want to revise plans to demonstrate that. I don't think that's appropriate. If this was a machine shop where they are all employees, which meant most of them live locally or something, yeah, uh, public transportation would work, but this is a recreational facility and people that go to that aren't, I don't think are the type to use public transportation. I, I think that if you'd asked that six months ago, there might be a different answer. Um, in light of the current pandemic, the use of public transportation, the use of private ride shares, uh, things along those lines, yeah. If anything, are being um, questioned by the CDC and the and how whether they should be used at all currently. Um, but Linda brings up a very valid point that, and it's it's a multiple point. It's not like. It, let's use one of their neighbors, well, let's say two products, for an example, 
where you have people that show up at 6 a.m. and leave at 6 p.m. And they know that the bus show, can bring them there at a certain time or take them away at a certain time. Then it's an easier avenue to, to promote and encourage employees to use public transportation because of the situation. This is relying on the public to use public transportation. And I'm not sure if it's a viable option, especially if you're dealing with you know, league nights. I have no idea where these leagues come from or anything like that and how, how they get there. I don't think they're renting a bus or, they're, or uh, the PVTA is gonna bring them there on a, on a regular basis and then take them home when they happen to be done at 11 o'clock at night. But I don't, I, I don't know, but I, I, have a hard, I have a difficult time with the viability of that. Jeff? Can I just offer a couple of just quick comments, not to belabor this, but, you know, so a couple of things, you know, with respect to the, to the um, you know, public transportation and, and other, um, you know, other means of, of getting to the site that, you know, this day and age, I, it's, it's, um, it's almost irresponsible not to consider the location of bus stops and the proximity of, um, you know, uh, alternate forms of transportation as a way to, you know, get to the site. Again, the, the, there's easy bike access, there's public transportation directly across the street, uh, a bus stop, and certainly for, for many locations in, in um, densely developed downtown areas, that's the only means for, you know, for people to get to sites. And, you know, especially for, for areas of town, um, not just East Hampton, but elsewhere where, you know, parking is an issue and that it's more cumbersome to, to drive a vehicle that, um, you know, I, I have several friends who take a bus to go out at night because they don't want to worry about driving home at night and, and you know, whatnot. Um, and then the other comment I want to make is that, you know, this is a neighborhood business district. It's, it's intended to, um, you know, uh, at least in, in um, reading the zoning ordinance and the description of the, um, of the district that, you know, these are smaller businesses, um, you know, a little bit more intensive development. Um, it's not a, a rural residential area. And given the costs of, you know, the cost of land, the cost of development, um, you know, everything that needs to be done, this isn't a site that would um, you know, that can accommodate a, a couple hundred square foot convenience store just to have the parking that's, you know, necessary for it, that, you know, it, it's got to be, you know, this, this is not a terribly huge building. It's, you know, it's 36, 3,700 square feet um, on a single floor. And so it's not, you know, terribly large. And there's, you know, they, they need to build and, and have a um, you know, space big enough to be able to, to, to run a business and to, you know, generate some, um, you know, some income. And you just, you can't do that with a really small building on a, you know, on a site this size. They've only got access to developing, you know, again, about a third of the, of the overall site. So they're very limited as to what they can do. And to make this a viable project, um, you know, reducing the building in half just to build a big, bigger parking lot just doesn't make you know, financial sense. Um, so I, that's, you know, that's, the, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I'm, you know, we're happy to, to revisit and, and um, you know, entertain any other comments or questions. Um, but I just wanted to offer those two, um, offer those two comments. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, we, oh, Jamie. Yeah, um, just going back to the trip reduction plan. Um, I think um, so the ordinance does say 20% reduction, but I think the bigger issue is still just determining how many spaces would be required. Um, and if, you know, if the board says, you know, based off the whatever number that the board's going to require, if it, let's say it's at 30 spaces, a 20% reduction would bring it down to 24. Um, you know, but that, that has to be a long-term commitment and, um, Again, it's up to the board to decide, but I think the more salient point is to, to get that determination of how many spaces are the board's going to want to see before we can, before discussing 
how many to reduce for the trip reduction plan. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate that point. I'm putting the cart a little bit before the horse by bringing it up here. I just uh, acknowledging that this is going to be continued. I wanted to ensure that, the, that all parties were at least aware hypothetically of that being a conversation point for future. I appreciate that. Yeah, and sorry to go back to the trip reduction. Um, even though there's the increase of bike parking for four spaces, I view this um, pool hall as a more nighttime oriented business as opposed to daytime. And I think people are less likely to bike ride at night. You know, the path, the bike path, while it's convenient, is very dark at night. And so I think that the bikes, the bike parking is nice, but might be utilized less than, you know, we can, it might not be as utilized as we think. Okay. Oh, in the, in the uh, summertime, when they have those uh, concerts at the Millside Park there, which draw, I, I have to guess, over a thousand people, and they have a designated uh, parking for bikers because a lot of people come on bicycles, and this is a, a nighttime event. Okay. Um, and um, I understand um, Mr. Bundy and his neighbor at Keystone. Uh, concerned about parking because they have so much space, extra space that they're trying to um, rent out and they want to keep the parking for them. Um, and that's nice. But so you're saying that this little guy can't have his private little business by himself because all the parking has to be saved for these big guys. I mean, just public parking in back of, uh, um, you know, where they have the concerts there and stuff. And, um, you know, people find a place to park. That's the way it is. That's my opinion. Okay. So, you know, we, can I, we, we did draw can I say Can I say something just quickly? I'm sorry. Can I say something Will? quickly? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just, I just, um, the difficulty of, I, I'm not looking for more uh on street parking i but i am aware of what's happening in the neighborhood and um and i'm aware of what the repercussions will be for my neighbors and for the quality of what's going on i also want to point out that um i'm living within the footprint of my parking i have maybe one space per thousand square feet in my building and it sometimes feels like um, I'm diving from a high spot into a little pail of water, but I have to make decisions for my business based on the fact that I don't get anything more. I've got what I've got and I've got to work with that. And, and, um, and I just think that this is, is a plan that's far more ambitious than the parking that's being provided. And, and, and the other thing, I just had a question for the board, which is um, the bus routes are not very frequent in East Hampton. So when we talk about uh, public transportation, um, it's a bit of, um, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a high minded appeal that the Pioneer Valley transportation is not delivering on. Um, and that would be an interesting thing for the board to ask um, um, Berkshire Designs to look into, but I don't. I don't think that the bus routes are going to make for easy going for someone that's got a that that has a broad regional interest for someone coming from Palmer or from Greenfield or from West Springfield. I, I don't think that public transportation is really very realistic for the kind of regional draw that this this billiard hall is going to bring. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Um, with all that said, we did go a little bit further than I wanted to than our 730 time. Uh, but I appreciate everybody's insight and, and thought. And at this point, I think we're going to, you know, I uh, forget what the technical term is for what we're going to do with the meeting here. I always forget what it's called. Con continue. Continue. Yes, we're going to continue the meeting. For some reason, I couldn't think of the word. 
Um, we're going to continue the meeting. To, to be fair, next... I was terrified to say it. I, 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 I saw Jamie unmute and I said, oh, I hope I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. We're going to continue the meeting, uh, the hearing until our December 16th, 2020 meeting. At that point, we will have a chance to review the additional information that was provided by Berkshire Design and the applicant. Um, I will also ask any board members, if you have any additional questions or concerns, if you could get those to Curtis and or Jamie, uh, it would be greatly appreciated because uh, it will give them a chance to address those to Berkshire Design and the applicant. Uh, I know I have a couple that I've not noted down and I just, I, I just want to make sure my thoughts are clear before I, I go ahead and, and send them in. Uh, but I, I do have some additional questions and, and maybe some additional thought that I want to put into this applicant. So if, uh, if anybody does have anything, please feel free to send it into the planning department. Um, I think it is in, in everyone's best interest to do that. Uh, and that's what I know there. So if I could get a motion for continuance, I guess if that's the right word. I move we continue the hearing to our December 16th meeting at 6.15. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess we'll, well, technically it will be 6.15, yes. We have to set a time, I think, if we continue. Yeah, by, by code, we have, to set a, we have to set a time for 6.15. So 6.15, and we will go from there. All right, can I, do we have to roll call it? Yeah. Yeah. Second as well. up. All right. Once again, the uh, the show here. So Tony, first, 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 we actually need a second on the vote. I'm oh, sorry. we need a second. A second. It. Okay. Right. Thank you, Tony. So now, Tony, can you still vote? Could you yeah, give me an eye? I'm good with that. Okay, Steve. I'm good with that. Uh, Melinda. Yes. Lindsay. You're I'm muted. Mute. That's okay. Sorry. Approved. Okay, Jared. Yes. Okay. So at this point, the 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 hearing is going to be continued until the January or the December sixteenth meeting at six fifteen. And I would just like to um, add, um, Jeff, if there's anything that you are planning to submit, um, resubmit, um, if you can get that to us by um, the end of the day on December tenth. That will mm -hmm. give us sufficient, or actually, sorry, the, the week before, December 9th, uh, okay. the, that'll give us sufficient time to review it and forward it to the board so they can also review it as well. Great. Thank you. All right. Appreciate everybody's time. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Have a good thank evening. You. And I uh, hope everybody has a safe and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Same to you. At this so point, uh, motion for adjournment. I'll make a motion to adjourn. All right. And can we do that one or do we have to roll call that one too? Let's roll call that one. Everybody, we need them. a second. Second. I'll second. Okay. So down the line, Tony. Adjourn. Steve. Adjourn. Linda. Adjourn. Lindsay. Adjourn. Jared. Yes, adjourn. Okay. Well, you know, I'm going to be the holdout. Sure. No, let's go home. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. And uh, we'll see you uh, next month. All right. Yeah. yeah.